But that night, bird dropping fell on his eyes and he lost his eyesight. Ah, oh, I can't see. Oh my God, bird dropping in my eyes. I can't see. No. Hello and welcome to another episode of Growing Up Christian. I'm Casey. I'm Sam. I'm Jeremiah. And Sam has been chomping at the bit, just grinding his teeth. He's so excited to tell us about uh, how how annoying his week has been. Now, okay, uh, I feel like we're already making it sound more exciting than it is. But uh, I did have some things I wanted to share with you guys, and I figured I'd just wait until we hit the record button uh, because some of it is uh, some of it is just you know had a good time doing something, and that was nice. Some of it is I might. Um, uh, well, my wife and my friends who I was telling the story to earlier were trying to convince me that this is why I probably should be on some sort of anxiety medication, despite my, uh, insistence that I'm just fine. And, um, uh, but, uh, well, and then yesterday, uh, I'm going to start with this one. I thought, I thought for a moment I was actually going to die or, or, or oh. could have, um, so I got home from work yesterday and I was like, all right, I'm going to, I got to go for, I'm going to go for a quick run. Uh, so I throw in my headphones um, and you know, you get the headphones going, you can't hear around you. So you got to play it safe. You stay off to the side of the road. You make sure you're not going to get hit by anything. Um, but really you can't, you can't hear much of what's going on. Um, I'm not far from my house. Uh, I live on like a dirt road off of like a side road. So I come out off my dirt road onto the side road and I'm about halfway down going towards the main road and just out of my peripheral from coming up from behind me, this gigantic dog runs up behind me and jumps up at my face like and does like this, this nip. Um, and I like freaked the fuck out like ripped my headphones out of my ears and like the dog keeps jumping. So I'm like still in like this, like, like that, that reaction, like a fight or flight, flight. kind of response. Yeah. And I'm like, so I have my elbows out, like in my arms, just like the dog keeps jumping and I'm like shoving it back. Like I'm still like processing whether or not I'm going to be and it. It's trying to play bite. And like in, in the zone I was in, I'm like, I still just like, it took me a second to realize and, I, eventually I was just kind of yelled, well, someone get your fucking dog. And this guy comes like running out from behind his house. Like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's fine. He's like, he's friendly. He's friendly. And it, it, then it, then it like hit me that this dog is actually friendly. So then I'm like, all right, I start petting the dog and the, give the dog what it wants, which is just to play with the person that ran by its house. Um, so then the dog just goes back to the owner and shit. And I'm like, and he's like, he was, he felt awful. He was just very apologetic, but it was just like, man, run in with my headphones. I was like, couldn't see it coming. And it just comes jumping up at me from the side. I almost shit my pants. It was the, the most scared I can recall being in probably the past, like 10 years. <laughs> you didn't go for like the finger in the butthole. I, yeah, <laughs> I was like, am I going to have to like grab this thing by the jaws and rip its head open? Like, uh, I think Selena does in, uh, to one of the lichens in one of the underworld movies. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what would happen. Uh, what type of dog was it? Uh, I honestly don't. It was like a mutt of sorts. Big, okay. Big brown, somewhat like wavyish hair, but it was tall as fuck. It was like, I mean, its head was, you know, up to my like rib cage. It was a big dog. So anyway, yeah. I had I had a dog do that similar thing to me yesterday, and I don't know, dogs are scary. It's just terrifying. I like them. I get along with almost all of them. But then occasionally there's one that just is like acting erratic. And you when you feel like you can't trust it, mm. then it's immediately like it's terrifying. Yeah, dude. I mean, because I my first bad experience with a dog, I think I've told the story before, but I was a kid. Couldn't have been. I, I was younger than 10. That's all I could probably recall is like. And it was like chewing on a bone. Golden retriever. Nice family dog. And I went up to pet it. And 
It had food aggression. It's like, why is your dog out around people with a bone if it has food aggression? And it lunged up and like bit at my face and knocked me over. And it was like, scared the shit out of me. And I, I had been, I've really been afraid of most big dogs. Not afraid. Like if I get to know the dog and I, and I trust the dog, then there's zero fear. But like when it comes to meeting new dogs that are bigger, like my, I'm immediately fearful of any dog like mid size, mid to large size dog. Um, just because of the, and then of course, yesterday's experience isn't going to, uh, exactly alleviate that baseline fear. When I meet new dogs, like, uh, I'm not interested because some dogs have, like, they seem even by, I remember my wife's dog, uh, when I first started dating her, I'd like go over, she had this gigantic lab. It was like, it looked like a bear. It was the biggest lab I had ever seen uh chocolate lab and it was like it was just it had moments of being you know ornery especially as it got older and it had some weird behaviors with some people at times and like just just enough for me to be like always a little nervous when i went to pet it like ah how how you doing like and you do a little pat and you're like that's enough that's enough like because you just don't know maybe that dog will be like that's fine it's fine it's fine it's fine and then the dog's like yeah i'm sick of this like a cat it's like a, like when cats love it, they're like, you're petting them, you're scratching the back of their neck, and they're like curling their backs, they're purring, and then they're just like, yeah, fuck this shit. And they swat at your <laughs> eyeballs. It's like when you give that disposition to anything large, it gets scary. And dogs can also tell when you're nervous to pet them too, which doesn't help. Very like true. They're, they're yeah. very good at detecting your body language. So they're probably like, what? What's wrong? What? What's going on? Are you a threat? Why, why are you not being cool? Yeah. Like it's a lab you know it's not smart enough to have like deep thoughts yeah <laughs> it's just gonna no, go all off but it's true because even my dog uh, has like a lot of anxiety uh very fearful of everything and if like like my foster son will have like a friend over or something and if, if we're home especially with my kids and they come upstairs and, the, and my dog sees someone doesn't recognize he freaks out at first barking barking um and then he'll like he'll chill out when he realizes who it is but uh What's always funny is if we're not home, he immediately runs and hides under the table and like cowers in fear. So it's like he'll be brave and like aggressive or a- appear to be aggressive for the sake of like trying to protect the family. But like he, it's all based on just being terrified of everything. And we're all just fine. We're like, hey, how's it going? And then it ta- he's not reading or he's so fearful. He's not even reading her body language at that point where it's like, but if we're not home, he's just cowering for his life somewhere. He thinks he's going to be murdered constantly. <laughs> Maybe you can channel your fear and anxiety into some form of like eroticism. Yeah. You know? With my dog, just connect with my dog on a sexual level, you mean? Yeah. Or like, I mean, let's not get weird about it, but you know, you could look up like furry porn or something. Oh, okay. That stuff that that guy yeah, we had something. on draws. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, Van- German Jonathan shepherds Van- with huge human boners. You. <laughs> uh, uh, so anyway, let's go. Uh, what else? So here, the, the, I went to Boston, um, Jeremiah's favorite city. Uh, Did you pay like thirty five dollars to park somewhere? No, actually, and I was prepared to. So uh, Manchester Orchestra and Jimmy Eat World were playing in Boston. Uh, had a fantastic fucking time. We had Andy Prince on a uh, bit previously from Manchester. Um, so I was messaging with him uh, on my way into the city uh, and uh, ended up hanging out with him after the show, hung out with them. We just drank some beers and uh, hung out on the sidewalk till about 1 a.m. when they took off to their second to last show in Buffalo. So, I, I mean, that was one of the most fun times I've had going to a show in a long time. Um but on my way there, it was like, oh, and speaking of Andy, uh, he's doing some super cool shit. Uh, and, and we talked about uh, having him back on the podcast to talk about it and stuff, too. So um, for anyone who enjoyed our episode with Andy from Manchester, he will be back soon after he settles in from being away on tour for two months uh, as he recovers from that tour lifestyle. But um on my way in, so I find parking. All right, I go. Uh, it's at the the show's at the MGM Music Hall. And it's right near Fenway Park. Uh, for anyone who's been to uh, Boston, uh, Newberry Street. At the end of Newberry Street is like maybe half a mile from there. So I park, and I was shocked 
that I was able to sp- spend like seven bucks on parking because it's like metered parking till eight on a what day was it was a Thursday night was the show. Uh, so I got in around six thirty. I paid for an hour and a half to park, and after eight, I'd be all in the clear. So I get in my car. I start walking to the show and I'm like the venue and I realize it's warmer than I expected it to be. So I'm like, I'm going to turn around, throw my sweater in the car. I realize that I'm pretty, I'm too close to a fire hydrant. And I'm like, it's almost seven. The show's starting. Manchester's supposed to start around seven. Like if I leave to find a new parking spot, I'm going to drive around in circles for at, like I mean, maybe five minutes, maybe 30. You never know when you're in Boston. And like, now that it's after seven, like when I pulled in, parking was a little more available, but now it's like Thursday night, like people are going out to drink. People, there's a lot of places to drink on Newberry Street. I'm like, I, I should move my car. But then I'm like, I don't want to miss the show. So I start walking back to the show. I get to the end of Newberry Street. And then I'm like, I'm going to get a ticket. And I know if I get a ticket, it's just going to ruin my night. I'm going to be pissed. It's a hundred bucks for a parking ticket. I should have just found a fucking garage. And I'm like, all in my head about it. So I walk back to my car. I get back to my car and I'm like, maybe the person in front of me will leave soon and I can just pull into their spot. That's an insane thing to think. You have no idea how long that person has been parked there or if they care about parking time limits at all, because a lot of people don't uh, care about getting tickets in Boston, which is why I probably shouldn't have either. Because when there's 50 cars legally parked around you, you probably, you might just not get a ticket, but then I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to miss a show. It's not a big deal. Just don't be an idiot. Don't don't be like this. Like, just go and have a good. So then I start. I do this about 15 times. I start walking back. I go back to my car. I hang out. Jeez. I looked like I was going to plant. I looked like one of the fucking Boston bombers getting ready to blow up half of Newberry <laughs> Street. Walking back up and down, shifty eyed as fuck, like looking at my car, looking up the street, like I'm waiting for something to explode. I look like a goddamn domestic terrorist at this point. And I just, I, so then I'm like, I finally think I decide I'm not going to, I go back up, start walking the show. And then I have like the total like panic over nothing. So I run back to my car and as soon as I get to my car, the person in front of me gets in their car to leave so I can pull up and I can be 10 feet away from this fucking fire hydrant. As soon as this person starts pulling out, the student SUV pulls up next to me and puts his blinker on to take the spot. So I'm still stuck next to the fire hydrant. I finally say, fuck it. I pull out, drive up the street and about eight spots up. Someone pulls out and I take the last fucking parking spot on Newberry Street and then run to the show, make it just in time for them to start. But it was about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes of me walking up and down the street like a complete psychopath trying to decide whether. And if I just moved my car the first time, I would have had plenty of time. And I wouldn't have had to live in that panic or I could have just made the choice to not and just found a way to enjoy my night. Uh, But either way, uh, I couldn't. And uh, after mentioning that story to my wife, she was like, it's just insane to me that you don't think that you shouldn't at least try some form of medication for that. (laughs) Like that's you live your life like that constantly. I mean, how often does does something like that happen? to uh, you though? A lot. I get stuck on dumb shit a lot like that. Uh, And then even last time I I got, we were in, my wife and I went to Boston, we went out to eat uh, and parked on Newberry street. And I'm like, for the, I'm constantly looking at my phone, like checking the time we're creeping up on it. I'm like, we gotta go. We gotta go. We went get a parking ticket. She's like, there's nobody it's all of Boston. No one's standing next to our car waiting to put a fucking parking ticket on the window. But I'm just sitting there like the entire time we're eating. It's like I'm clearly unsettled, like wondering if we'll get a parking ticket. And it's thir- it's probably 30 bucks for a fucking parking ticket. It's not like a big deal. I don't know. Yeah. I can't get out of my well, own way on that one. That's why uh, the brothers Zar and I have bought pressure cookers, though. One too many parking tickets. That's it. <laughs> So we know I'm on a dangerous path without medication. They should have tried Kratom. Yeah, <laughs> I can't. Kratom. I should have tried Kratom. I, I'm surprised they didn't give that shit a shot. So the only <laughs> lesson I take from that is I don't want to live anywhere where I have to deal with parking like that. Like if I can't drive somewhere and park in the giant parking lot and walk to the place, I don't want to go there. 
That's why I yeah. usually don't even go to shows in Boston. Like I could be, it could be my favorite band of all time headlining. And I'm like, but I have to drive to Boston. It's takes me like 55 minutes to get there without traffic. And, um, I'm just like, it's, it can be so much work to figure out where to park. And it's such a pain in the ass that I don't when I go, often. When like I go going. to the Ritz in, uh, North Carolina for concerts in Raleigh, uh, there's a 24 hour fitness that's, parked like that's uh it's like technically a block and a half away but there's like a whole costco complex between the venue in there and i just want to pay 15 dollars for the crummy venue parking where it's like just a chain link fence around like a field basically and there's only like one big entrance and exit so it's going to be a giant traffic jam for 30 minutes and i'd rather just walk 10 minutes walk a block or two away to the 24 hour fitness where nobody knows if you're supposed to be there or not like you just yeah yeah park with all the other cars and leave although the anxiety thing i know what you mean because the first time I went there, um, the venue was right next to a Costco. So at first I was like, oh, I'll just park at Costco. Like, there's not going to be that many people at Costco this time of night. And I'm a Costco member. Like, I have every right to be here. And then I just decided to Google. I was like, wait, it's right next to a concert venue. I'm not the only person who's ever thought of this. Yeah. So I Googled <laughs> Ritz, the Ritz, Raleigh, Costco show parking. And of course, the internet is completely split on Reddit of people being like, I park there all the time. I've parked at Costco for 10 years. It's no big deal. And then other people have been like, <laughs> you will get towed. If you park at Costco, they will absolutely 100% tow your car. Cause nobody like Costco is not open at 11 at night. They know you're there for the concert. Right. And it's you're not just... supposed to be there and they'll tell you. And so I did park there and I walked all the way to the venue. And then I turned around and walked back and got in my car and drove it to the planet fitness and then got out and walked like three quarters of a mile to get there is an actual thing to be worried about getting towed. that was the thing i was worried about i was like i could deal with a ticket like if it's a 50 dollar ticket or something i'll just be like oh well cost of the concert but like if my car gets towed and i'm three hours from home and it's almost midnight like that's gonna be a really bad night i don't know anybody in this town that's gonna suck um outside the show there was this guy wearing what like a cardboard i mean like a wooden sign it's like a front and back is like two wooden signs connected by rope. Um, And he would just, he was wearing it over his shoulders and had like, you guys know the old image of like the cross cover, like over the uh, connecting one side of fiery regime to the other with all the fires. Yeah. All the fire underneath. It's um, he, it was like that with like a thousand Bible verses just plastered all over it. Tacky as fuck as they always are. It's like the same aesthetic as a shit ass tract. And, um, I, I forgot I texted uh, my buddy about it and he was uh, he I that guy used to hang out outside of the venue that and, and that we used to go to all the time uh, or I still go to a good bit at the Worcester Palladium. He used to be outside of that. I guess he just goes outside of shows a lot. So I guess he's made his way out to Boston, but he's just handing out tracks and stuff. And I'm like, I wish I wasn't here by myself right now. Uh, my immediate thought was that I was with Casey because I'm like, it would have been so fun to just fucking talk to this dude. Like, what is your, what is your success rate, dude? Cause you look like a piece of shit, just handing out like litter to people. And you're hoping that this does anything. Like you've been doing this since I was in high school. This guy's old as shit too. He looked like he could barely hold up the signs over his shoulders. And you're just like, you've been doing this for so long. I can't imagine you've converted one person and you're still at it. Like you're going so hard. Uh, it's just, I would have loved to have spoken with him if I wasn't, if I didn't waste 25 minutes trying to figure out whether or not I should park my car or repark my car. I might've been like, what are you even doing? But he did try to hand me one. And I just kind of laughed and was like, I'm, I'm all set. I wish I had time to explain to you that I've been in whatever you're doing for enough time to know that I, I you know, he's probably all that interested in your story. I no, think he's, he's probably there not. for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have he, you guys ever he, been? It's all his own guilt. He's like trying to absolve some guilt. Maybe he, he takes murdered it off his entire night, family. Fights crime like uh, Rorschach. Have you guys ever been witness to in public? Not like a guy handing out tracks, but like someone targets you in public. Hmm. I, I think so. Not enough to no. like be notable. Yeah, nothing that sticks out. I the it happened to be for the first time last year. I was at a local coffee shop. It was like middle of the of day course. on a Friday and I had just like gotten my hair cut. I was off that day. I just went to the coffee shop to like sit, grab a coffee, chill for a few minutes. I was catching up with some work emails and I guess I noticed out of the corner of my eye, there was lots of college students in the coffee shop 
and there were these like two girls who looked like they were probably college age and they were sitting with somebody on some couches and it looked like maybe they were having a bible study or something and at one point they like they prayed and then <laughs> put their hands in the middle yelled break and then they all went out to try <laughs> to talk to someone else in the coffee shop <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know if they were actually with this person or not. Like later at the time, I just assumed like, yeah, I guess they're having a Bible study or something, whatever. Like I just saw it out of the corner of my eye. And, and then I think I was like, I saw the girls wandering around talking to a few, like they wandered past a couple times, but it, it didn't seem that crazy. Like it's a coffee shop that a lot of college students are at and people are walking around talking to each other. So again, nothing really seemed like that out of the ordinary. And then I was reading my phone, like reading a work email or something. And I just heard like, a, excuse me, excuse me, sir, which Nothing makes you feel middle aged more than somebody sir in you. Uh, and and I looked good up comes from that either. Exactly. And they were yeah. holding like a banana and an apple. And one of them was like, would you like a piece of fruit? Oh. And I think I just stared at them and I was like, what? And I felt bad later because I was like, I'm sure I was rude, but I was just staring at them like, thank you. No, Why let's be clear. They were the rude ones. You were just they, awkwardly they were responding. Being, they were being very pleasant, but I definitely handled it awkwardly. I was just like, no. Like, that's all I said was just like, no, I don't want a piece of fruit. And they looked a little dejected and they walked away. And I was like, and at first I was like, that was weird. Like, I don't know why they would think to do that. And then I saw they went up and approached somebody else and offered them a piece of fruit. And I was like, oh, and later I saw them sitting with someone else and they had their Bible open chatting. I'm like, that was their witnessing opener. Oh, and man. I would and I love like for that. some fruit to happen right you should have told them you'll take a banana if they hold it for you while you eat it (laughs) uh i would like to not go to jail so i'm not going to do that (laughs) i isn't it interesting that there's like a trillion different kinds of apples at this point but we still just have bananas well there's Uh, a trillion different kinds of bananas too but they only sell like one variety right and the ones they sell in america are not are not actual like classic bananas didn't they go extinct what we I have now is just an offshoot of an offshoot. Yeah, Chiquita bananas. <laughs> it's it, but it's like every, every. I feel like every fall there's a new like crossbreed of apple, but it's always just the same kind of banana. I mean, are plantains in the same banana family? I don't know. I just know like you find them in a bunch <laughs> sitting in a fucking pyramid in your grocery store. No matter where I've lived or where I've shopped, it's always just bananas. And then there's like a section for 15 different apples. I, I, you're not correct. There are more apple variants than bananas for sure. At least in the United you States. Just, you just fact checked uh, my, my joke. I started fact checking. Well, I already knew some information <laughs> about it. I just feel like that's going to be way too long of a rabbit trail. That's very interesting about the history of bananas, but that is not at all related to this podcast. And as much as I'd like to talk about it, I don't. The history of bananas is whack as fuck. Let's be clear. (laughs) Everyone Google the history of bananas. If you never want to eat a banana again, thankfully I don't like bananas, so I can be morally, I can take the moral high ground on this one. That Uh, is a, but don't get me started on Levi's jeans because I will still wear those. (laughs) Well, it sounds like we don't need to get you started. You've already made your point clear. You don't care which little Honduran child sewed them. You're like, they're still comfortable. What is it? Johnny Morris. Is he the YouTube guy that does like the, he used to work for Vice or something, and now he does his own videos where he'll dive into the history of something. He did one about bananas that went into the whole history of the like United Fruit Company or whatever it was. And, you know, we basically like murdered all of Guatemala into uh, farming our genetically modified bananas for us and stuff. Yeah. That does seem to be how we do things as a species. <laughs> like the history yeah. of pretty much anything, at some point you're going to get to the genocide chapter and you're yeah. like, wow, <laughs> why, why is it always going this direction? Is uh, the natural human tendency, I think. Well, there's plenty of good podcasts on the history of bananas if y'all uh, want to check it out. But uh, oh, I think that's f- it for my complaining. Um, I did uh, experience a high amount of rage when um we were leaving a brewery this weekend um you guys know brewer i mean they're the most family friendly places uh, made now right like everyone tries to make breweries pretty family friendly would you uh casey you probably don't go to a lot of them but i don't jeremiah you've probably frequented a few i mean they're yeah usually the ones around us are like they're in the mountains so they're very outdoorsy lots of picnic tables like bringing you know, food trucks like they yeah, have seltzer like it's not just for like alcoholics and dads who 
like just pretend that this is their new hobby. They're, they're kind of like parks that yeah. sell alcohol. Yeah. But we were leaving and this guy was walking past us. He had like a case, he was carrying a case of beer and my kids weren't anywhere in his way or anything like that. And he's just like, ha huh, kids at a brewery real fucking nice. And I just have never wanted to like, like just hurt somebody. Like I actually wanted, or like, I just wanted to take his case of beer and spike it into the ground. Like, fuck you, bitch. And then that's it. Like, it made me so angry because it's like everywhere you look at this place, there's families. It's all mostly families. They've done everything they can to make this like a nice place to be. They have trails that go around it. It's like little there's they do so much to make it family friendly. Um, and they're actually pretty like weird in that, like on certain day, like during the weekdays and stuff, they'll like have a drink limit of two. And you have to like, like, they're not trying to create this atmosphere of like, just come here and get fucked up and then leave with a bunch of beer. And it's like, it's a very family friendly atmosphere. And it was strange that someone was so angry that like there were kids near there. And I was like, I don't know. That irked me more than it should have, certainly. And I complained about it the entire drive home. And I was getting like, I, he said it and I, it took me a second to process it. So then I start to get out of my car to like, just say something to him. Just, and, and my wife starts being like, don't fucking, don't do that. What the fuck's wrong with you? Like, you're going to get in a fight in a fucking brewery parking lot, you moron. <laughs> and I'm not, of course, I wasn't going to get in a fight because look at me. I'm a bitch. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> I'm not going to fight anybody, uh, but I would have been ready to run to my car. I can run fast enough. I would have been ready to go to my car and just leave. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to, I, I did want to like, you know, you do that thing where you're like, maybe I'll just wait and drive behind him for a while. Like, and then you're like, what's wrong? No, with me? I don't what? do that thing. I, no, you've I never had that, that feeling. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I'm just on. like, let's I'll have everybody go home. That's the, I don't want to see this hmm. person or speak to this person again. You have never had the urge to drive behind somebody just and just follow them for a bit, just to. I think you, I don't you mess up, around. On you grew the road up in, a, in that way. Yeah, you grew up in a different part of the country than we did, Sam. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's the problem. I feel like it's just like they'll be like, "Is this guy following me?" And then they just put on their blinker, and you put on your blinker, and then like right around the time you see him pick up their cell phone is when you just take a left. <laughs> Yeah, now, where I grew up, I don't know if they'd be picking up their cell phone. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they'd be picking up a shotgun <laughs> off the Maybe. rack of the back of the truck. Yeah, <laughs> a crossbow. There was a time. Uh, there was a, it was several years ago, but someone um, on the Mass Pike. Uh, there was a road rage incident, and uh, the person who was left the most angry w- took out a crossbow and shot the person with it and killed them. So, oh my gosh. Now that's that cool. is a deliberate action because a crossbow is not easy to cock and load. <laughs> no. <laughs> you had, to, you had some time to think about it. Yeah, yeah you, you can't have been carrying that in the car like cocked and loaded, right? Like you would need at least 30 seconds to get that thing ready. He put I on would cruise control. Not. Dude, what <laughs> held the crossbow what between you, his legs? If you had a crossbow hanging on the back window and it went off like while you're driving, <laughs> like I don't know what would happen. I mean, it wouldn't go through the side of your car. I don't. I mean, maybe depending on the tip, I guess. But like, oh my god, you're gonna have graphite shards in every part of your body. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> probably blind. <laughs> About the following people thing. When I was 17, me and a guy I worked with, like he was kind of a friend at the time. I'm not endorsing this, but we used to do this thing where, like, you're driving home late at night, you get up behind somebody, and you just pull right up behind them, and then cut your lights off like all of a sudden and you just drive using their <laughs> headlights because they can see your running lights and it freaks them out every time. Cause they're like, this car just coming up behind them and then just disappears. And then sometimes like everyone notices the lights disappear. Not everybody sees like the reflection of their brake lights off the car right. or something. So they don't know where you've been gone for a couple seconds. They hate it. Oh man. People just driving home from work, minding their own business. They really don't like that. <laughs> that's such I'm like sure a high do. school move to that's it such is. like a young high where you think like, like, uh, my foster son ended. He he got too many speeding tickets within his first like year of getting his license and had to go to like driving school again and shit like that. And it's just like, it's like I'm a good driver. You're like one one of these. And I know what you're saying. And I would have said that. But one of these days, you'll look back and go, literally, what I was doing 
is what makes me not a good driver. <laughs> like, right. Like I'm it, technically capable of being a good driver, but I'm an idiot. That's dodging the that car I'm... by a narrow margin while going 90 miles an hour doesn't make you a fucking NASCAR driver. It makes you lucky. Oh, and man. That makes me furious. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> usually, not... maybe I don't do the kind of things in traffic because I'm usually the one in the wrong. <laughs> like I've usually I'm usually the one that like drifted in front of somebody else because I was reading watching Bible YouTube. stories. Yeah, you were watching YouTube <laughs> while driving. I can see you also being the guy that makes everybody angry because you're driving like eight miles below the speed limit because you're just watching a video Do, while driving. You're not does your work truck speed. have like adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist? No. It seems like it'd be a good investment for the company to get you one of those. <laughs> <laughs> like I, hey. I drove a friend's F-150 that had like the, the blue crew or super cruise or whatever Ford calls it, like the full self-driving on roads that they've mapped out. It was honestly pretty amazing. I mean, it, it was maintaining me at 35 to 45 miles an hour, like in stop and go traffic on the interstate for half an hour. I did nothing. My hands were in my lap. I was just sitting back chilling and the truck did everything. Oh, like, that sounds and- so fun. Because traffic is like stressful, you know, stop and go interstate traffic is stressful and frustrating, whatever. And not at all. I'm just sitting back chilling, listening to a podcast. As long as I keep my eyes like relatively forward, most of the time systems happy. I'm just chilling. That would be fun. That's sick. I want to try one of those. That would be, oh my God. I feel like that would almost, um, I wonder if I'd have a higher propensity for falling asleep while driving. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's keeping it's watching your eyes. Like if I even look my eyes down too much to grab a water or something, it starts chiming softly to let you know, like, nah. And then just, you, just but you're like not looking at it. So if you close seat your massager eyes. pinches one nut. Yeah. <laughs> like not hard, just a little like <laughs> Well, it gives you it gives you a little warning, and then if you don't do it, then it starts chime it chimes loudly and turns off the self driving stuff and you have to take over. It turns well, off the self driving yeah. stuff right when you like aren't actually ready to drive uh, it. I, I, I think those it systems you have the ability. Off a I think they can break too. Like they can bring the vehicle to a stop if you're just like if you just jumped into the back seat or something. Like I think it would just bring the vehicle to a stop. Yeah, it's uh maybe there. It's got to have some sort of like uh in the front in the driver's seat, right? Like if it has, it's like the you know when um uh for airbags, right? In the passenger seat, it's like it, it knows if someone's sitting in it or not just based on like weight. Oh no, it's way it's way more than that. Like it is actually watching your eyes in the truck I was driving. Like it can see if your eyes are looking towards the road or looking down or anything like that. Yeah, I don't want and that. It can, it can tell <laughs> by sensors in the steering wheel. It can tell if you're actually holding the steering wheel or not when you're just doing like adaptive cruise control and not full self driving. And so the, if you're not the problem with that though is that means when you get in an accident, you lose that excuse that you know, a squirrel ran out into the road and you tried to dodge it. And I think now they'll just know you fell asleep and that, that sucks. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Does it? (laughs) Yeah. Can it tell if you're drunk? (laughs) It sees in your eyes. It's like the whites of your eyes look pretty yellow right now. I think there are patents for that, for like being able to detect the, the like alcohol content. That'll be a thing for sure, dude. I can't imagine that not being a thing at some point. That's invasive. Big well, brother th- looking over your shoulder. There's been people who have tried to pass legislation before for having a breathalyzer installed in every car for just the same idea of like, no one will be able to drive drunk again. But those are so invasive. Like you <laughs> the roads are time. empty, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I, I want to see a movie the, uh, like that where the road, like they do that and the roads are like completely empty. It's just, that's one thing I really hate. If you ever have to like get up super early for something, I'm leaving the house at like two or 3 AM, any other car on the road. I'm like, Oh, why are you out right now? Yeah. Cause like, they're drunk. What are you doing? Yeah. Trying to get home. Yep. Or they're yeah. barfing in the back of the Uber. <laughs> Okay, so before we jump into our story today, which we're going back to the apocrypha, uh, we, we can't get enough to... of it. It's like it's like the reading the Bible for the first time for people who have read the Bible too many times. Yeah, there's so many stories that are not in the Bible for some reason or another, but then they seem like they should fit right in there. Yeah, until you dragons know? are involved, that did get that that pulled me out a little bit. I just kept thinking it must be like a crocodile. Yeah, but you could know. look at it that way. I mean, I guess we did also read a book called Job where there's like a behemoth and the Leviathan. And we were like, yeah, that sounds about right. And then David's like, and a dragon. We're like, fuck you, David. You're an idiot. Dragons. <laughs> so dumb. 
<laughs> okay, so before we jump back into that, we should uh, give a little plug for our buddy, uh, our buddies in Mighty, the band, because yes. they're releasing a record this this week. So I just uh, shared it on the check Instagram. that out. Oh wait, that will um, this will be out after that Instagram post goes away. <laughs> yeah, uh, the story share, but um. Yeah, if you uh, if you haven't listened to them yet, you should go check them out. It's good, chill, uh, just fun to listen to stuff. And uh, we're pretty excited. They had a lot of trouble getting this record done and, and put out to the public. Yeah. And it's finally happening now. So good for those guys. And go check them out. Mighty. So that being said, uh, so this week we are going into a book that I had never heard of before called Tobit. Tobit. You guys know about Tobit? No, it's another book in the Apocrypha? Yes. Okay, Yeah. never heard of it. Very much an Old Testament book, and it seems like maybe it's kind of set in that same time period as like Elijah and whatnot, you know? Um, Some of the more fun prophets. Or, yeah, they're like established already and and stuff, but uh, Tobit is a, it's a strange one. There's some... There's some really fun details and it's a whole book. It's like, I don't know, 12 chapters or something like that. But like, Ooh. you know, like most Old Testament books, there's a lot of uh, redundancy and saying the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, we want to hit the high notes. Yeah, lots of lamenting, lots of praising, and they all kind of blend together at some point. But um, so the book starts out with Tobit telling us a little bit about himself. And as it turns out, he was a great dude. He says, I, Tobit, have walked all the days of my life in the ways of truth and justice, and I did many alms deeds to my brethren and my nation who came with me to Nineveh into the land of the Assyrians. Oh, the Assyria. We know the Bible hates Assyria, too. That come up a lot. So if he's, <laughs> yeah. if he's doing shit in the land of the Assyrians, he's really tooting his own horn. Yeah, the Assyrians, I don't think the Assyrians were popular with anyone. I think literally the entire known world like, <laughs> rejoiced when they imploded. Yeah, 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 they definitely did. It's like, have you listened, Jeremiah, have you listened to the like Dan Carlin uh, hardcore history stuff where he hits on the Assyrians? Is, is it many, many years ago? Yeah, it would have been. A I, while. I think so. It, I don't remember a lot of the details, but I that sounds right. It's interesting because they talk about like these Assyrian reliefs that you can go look at in like the London Museum of History and stuff like that, and it's it's just like basically just like a big square bearded dude in a lumpy hat, like sitting on top <laughs> of a pile of heads. <laughs> it's like like a storm i slew them i sowed salt upon their fields i ruined their land so yeah everybody hated them but uh all of it was smelled like burning flesh constantly i probably i don't think that's far from the truth honestly so the king at the time was this guy named enemesar enemesar and Tobit found himself in a position where even though he was a Jew living in the land of uh, Nineveh, he was favored by the king, got in good with the king and actually became like a high ranking official a purveyor is what they called him. I don't know what all that entails. It's probably like ratting on other Jews. This feels very <laughs> Josephy right now. It is a little like that. Um, so he's in a position of authority, uh, well-respected. He's kind of looking after the interests of, uh, of the Jewish people there and making some coin. The dude was putting money away, thinking about the future. So, and it specifically references this part that plays into the, you know, later in the story, but he has a friend named Gabel, which is, I like that name a lot, in the city of Rages. Rages? Dude, it's spelled like plural rage. Dude, it's like uh, Sam had many rages upon the highways. Yeah, it's like uh, complete ragers all the time. Rave City, Mosh City. They don't. It's basically like it's it's Las Vegas. It's what it is. It was Burning Man, but you didn't have to run over climate protesters to get there. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you didn't have to squash anybody with a truck in order to get there on the on the road back. In the <laughs> but so his buddy Gabel in the city of Rages, he goes to him and basically says like, "Hey." I want to set some money aside. Can you look after that? Can I leave some money here with you? And so he left him 10 talents of silver, which any idea how much a talent is? Any guesses? No idea. Uh, a week's worth of wages. I think it was more than that. So from what I could tell from Googling, a talent was roughly 3,000 shekels or 75 to 100 pounds. It was like the highest weight of or unit of weight measurement at that time period. So the dude left a thousand pounds of silver with his buddy Gay Bell. That's a lot. Wait, you can't move that easily. The, That's yeah, what about why the parable, virtual currency rules. What about the parable of the talents though? It makes it seem like a talent is a lot smaller and you can take and like bury it in the ground. Well, or inflation, that, you know? Yeah. I was just about to ask, like, I don't know how much inflation <laughs> happens because this is old Testament, right? Like what, yeah. do we know canonically what books this should slot in between? Oh, actually, the parable Somebody of talents. Somebody probably could look that up. I did not. The par- This is uh, two to three hundred BC. I looked. Okay, it up. so there's been at least some inflation probably since then. Yeah. Okay. Well, that well, means that that well, that means when Jesus told the parable of the talents that they should be worth more, but it seems like they might be worth less in Jesus. I see the. I guess well, that's the a, problem. It's a unit of the economy weight. crashed sometime between this story and when Jesus made a, a parable about it. Well, weight stays the same. It actually is not infected by. Are affected by inflation. Yeah, but it is affected by gravity. I'm just nerding and I out heard on, that on economics. Um, you know, it's my I, my bad. I heard that a space <laughs> uh, space ray uh, impacted the way gravity affects money uh, at that point. So. <laughs> Only if you store it in a blue container, right? <laughs> and, and if it's located specifically in Hawaii, and I don't think the story took place in Hawaii, so. Uh, I'm not sure that this counts. <laughs> I feel like I I trusted you when I told you uh, my beliefs about space space lasers, <laughs> and you're being very disrespectful. I betrayed right you. Now. I'm sorry. So condescending. So any <laughs> anyways, so a thousand pounds of silver he left with Gay Bell. Now today a. a an ounce of silver is worth $24.69. So by today's standards, that's about $400,000 worth of silver that he left with his buddy. Pretty good. That's a lot. I mean, that's more... That's a 1,300-square-foot house on a quarter of an acre in most places. That is like a full-size mattress full of $100 bills. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) So uh, hauling around a thousand pounds of silver. Okay, so here's an interesting just whatever thing. Three hundred ninety five thousand dollars worth of silver is a thousand pounds, right? If you converted that to gold, which everyone, everyone should invest in gold. That's 13 pounds of gold. What? Gold weighs. So wait, gold is worth way more. It's worth like nineteen hundred dollars an ounce. And that brings me to today's sponsor. So, uh, <laughs> I accomplished a lot in 2020, exposing the truth, establishing the relationship with you, working tirelessly for America. And I came to know the work and value of the people at American Hartford Gold. Give them a call and tell them Rudy sent you. Text Rudy to 65532. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he's just literally like smoking a bl- like a soggy <laughs> cigar and dripping brown liquid the whole time he was reading that ad, I bet. <laughs> Trying to fuck someone in their 20s. <laughs> <laughs> I want to claim my gold. I want to claim my gold. <laughs> God damn. Dude, is there anybody worse than him? I mean, arguably he's like like uh, we know Trump sucks and but honestly, does he even hold a candle to Rudy? I Rudy's way up there, dude. He's it, he's the biggest. <laughs> he's simp so of all annoying. Time. He's pathetic. It, it's like the pathetic. It's it's the epitome of pathetic adult man. Like you're too old to still be like this. Like this is that's the game for a man in their twenties who's just trying to like suck the right cock to get where they need to be, and he's just still doing it. 
He's still going off, trying to just like snuggle up to whoever he needs to. It's he's it, to the point where he's doing Hartford Gold. Like it's it's like when you're watching uh, Breaking Bad and you like see it's like and Saul Goodman just kind of does this Better Call Saul commercials where you're like it just feels sad. And, and of course, then you watch Better Call Saul and you get the backstory and you have a whole different take on him. But like that just snivelly like shit commercial where you're clearly just simping for money it's it's sad it's like he monetized being the guy that sends food back at like chain restaurants <laughs> yeah. gotta figure out how to make money on this i really want to it's simply <laughs> too good it's too good some people really hate this <laughs> 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 I finally got a think you should leave clip just for yeah, you. It took us. It took you a while. That's one of my favorites too. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> bottom line is to- Tobin is or Tobin is doing well for himself, right? But that all changes when uh, the king and a messer dies. So he passes away. And his son ascends the throne. His son, Sennacherib. And he is not as cool as his dad. And he is not a fan of Jews. He starts just killing them. Doesn't really give a lot of details as to why or what the timeline of that is. It just kind of says Sennacherib comes into town and starts just murdering Jews. So well, that's Tobin. been an unfortunate theme throughout history. Also, it's just like the whole kid sucking. Like, it's like. You know, dad was cool, and then like he dies, and the kid inherits all of his bullshit, and he's just trash. Is probably one of the most common themes throughout history. Yeah, it does seem to go that way. I just can't wait to be sons. a, a <laughs> the next link in that chain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess you're on that trajectory. <laughs> See, I'm glad I didn't do that. My dad, uh, he makes uh, false teeth, and he's great at it. Uh, it's a very, it, it was always a very artistic job where it's like, you're literally hand carving these false teeth and you're like hand painting them. They're just like, it's, it's an actual work of art until uh 3d printing came into town. And my dad is always like, he used to want, at, there was a time where he wanted us to like maybe consider getting into his business. Cause it was, he's, he's the third or fourth generation doing it. And it, then it was like, he he he's just barely going to squeak into retirement even late just because his whole industry got rocked by 3d printing. Anyone who like didn't anyone who did it by end, it's like these other companies came in they bought a bunch of 3d printers. They do 3d scans of your mouth and then they just churn out teeth now. And he's like, he can't compete. Uh, he's got a lot of doctors he still works with because like, um, they like his work. It's more of like, you know, higher craftsmanship but it's like it's one of those like whoo good thing none of us got into this because we would have just jumped into a completely dead industry and been in our 30s and had to like completely pivot well i guess i did that anyway so it would i could have just pivoted from that to what i'm doing now but uh, (laughs) you just gotta specialize if you're in that situation like start you know being the guy that's the best at drawing like tobacco stains onto dentures yeah to make it uh look at it dude it's such a crazy th- anyway no we don't need to get into that uh 3d so, printing ruining my dad's life thanks 3d printing no so tobit is such a good guy right he cannot stand to see like all these dead bodies laying around and so he buries them that's kind of his thing it's a problem for him a couple of times throughout this stories when a, when he finds a corpse he buries it that's the mark of a quality human so yeah, and uh, apparently the locals, Ninevites, did not like that. They felt uh, they wanted the bodies to be exposed and to, you know, I don't know, I guess be a lesson to other people or whatever. So they go. They and only tell like Sennacherib. the bodies buried up to the shoulders, just past the shoulders. That was their move. They're like, you can't bury them completely. We need you to like they want bury them, them. Their heads sticking out like cabbages. Yeah, and they're still preferably alive at that point. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, yeah, that you was an actual move. Like a flower to be clear, pot. That was an actual move. I'm to, that's a historical uh, 
Yeah, you bury them like, and then you yeah. like cover them in honey and stuff and wait for things to get Yeah, in. yeah. You bury them just past their shoulders and you wait for them to uh, just die by yeah, exposure. good times. Or wild animals. They perfected torture. I think, I mean, going back to it, like we just don't, we don't torture like we used to. Yeah, well, there's no time like the present, I guess. So anyways, uh, Tobit gets outed as the guy who buries dead bodies and Sennacherib doesn't like it. Tobit has to flee. Um, so he <laughs> takes that off the reason you have to flee town. You have buried like, this a body. guy won't stop digging holes. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes off and, uh, leaves his family behind, flees the countryside. And when that happens, it says then, then all my goods were forcibly taken away. Neither was there anything left me besides my wife, Anna and my son, Tobias. So, you know, crap into the stick. Also, the king didn't have that many children, and I feel like at this time you were still like having eight to twelve. So, I think he only had Tobias because that's the only one it ever mentions. Wild. The king had more kids though, and eventually they kill him and and take the throne for themselves. They kill uh, dad. The king's kids kill dad collectively, like it's a joint yeah. effort. It's his two sons kill him. And then take the throne for themselves. Okay. I'm sure one of them eventually killed the other two, probably. Just knowing how people are. But he uh, he's able to return thanks to the fact that, that uh, Sennacherib's gone. I wasn't clear on exactly the timeline that he had to flee, but it said it said something along the lines of like 50, 50 and, and five days. So I don't know if it was like two months that he had to leave for, but he lost his fortune and stuff when he did. But the point is that that guy's kids didn't have quite the same problem with burying bodies that dad did. Right. Exactly. So dad dies, kids take over. Tobin's like, whew, I can head back into town now. These guys don't hate, hate buried bodies like their dad did. Well, so he comes back. His family's happy to see him. It's around the time of Pentecost, and they prepare a big feast, right? But his son lets him know that one of their fellow Jews had been strangled. Uh, so Tobin sets out immediately to bury the man. <laughs> this guy can't stop. He's a monster. Oh, I know. He's on top of it. He really <laughs> is like the... Uh... <laughs> He's like giving, giving my dog Phoebe a bone, like... It's it's kind of like just handing her an hour's worth of stress. So she eventually <laughs> just goes and buries it and nobody gets to eat it. That's she really? She I think that's so funny. I, that feels like uncommon. I mean, I know it's like that's a trope is dogs burying bones, but I've never owned an animal that didn't like scarf down any snack you gave them and like treat it like it was fucking heroin. Oh, yeah, it's funny. Like, I'll catch her out there burying stuff sometimes. And and then she kind of, like, looks around real sneaky-like. And sometimes she second-guesses <laughs> herself. A lot like you, you with parking spots. And she'll go move it. Dude, me and her have a lot in common. I like this more. She needs a team of sale prescription or something. <laughs> so, uh, so Tobin goes and buries the body. Um, apparently... He got some flack from that from some of his friends. They're like, dude, you just got back after having to fl fled the country because you wouldn't stop burying bodies. And this, here you now, are again. It feels like an I think you should leave sketch now. It's like, he, I can't stop burying bodies, man. <laughs> <laughs> so being that he had touched a dead body, you know, he's got this feast waiting for him at home, but he had touched a dead body. He's technically unclean until he goes and gets purified through the ritual or whatever. Right, right. right. So instead of going back and into his house, he decides to sleep up against the wall of his like courtyard. Okay, because he can't go into his home because he's still unclean, right? Exactly. Okay. So it says that I knew not that there were sparrows in the wall, and mine eyes being opened, the sparrows muted warm dung into my eyes, and a whiteness came in my eyes. <laughs> what the fuck? And I went to the physicians, but they helped me not. So I went to the against physicians? the wall. Did you say physicians? Yeah, doctors the... couldn't help. They could not they could not possibly scrape the bird turns out of his eyes. <laughs> they just crossed it over in the evening. It it reminds me of that joke. I feel like I've told the joke on the podcast. My favorite joke when I was a kid was the pirate 
at the jet doing the job application. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah for people, what is it in case there's a, in case there's a few, uh, you're leaving hanging. They're going to, they're going to lose their goddamn minds if they don't hear the punchline. Uh, so pirate goes in to apply for like a management position at Applebee's and the guy's talking to him and he's like, well, look, uh, you know, you're, you're qualified. You've been a leader in the past. Like I, I do have some questions about uh, your attire and stuff. And he says, uh, you know, like where, what's up with the peg leg? Like where, what happened there? What, what, what's going on? Apparently HR standards were different in this universe, but he says, <laughs> oh, I was on the deck in the middle of a firefight and a cannonball took me a leg off. And the guy's like, wow, that's insane. Um, man, that's, that's incredible. I get it now. Okay. He goes, your, your hook though. What, What's going on? What happened with the hook? And he said, later on the same day, I was in a sword fight and I slipped and, you know, the guy took me hand off with his sword. And he's like, dang, you lost a, a, a leg and a hand in the same day. That's that is so wild. Jeez. And he goes, well, then, you know, what's up with your uh, your patch? You know, what happened to your eye? And he goes, I was standing on the galleon the day after the battle and I looked up and a seagull pooped in me eye. And the guy goes, okay, I, I didn't know that bird poop caused blindness. And he goes, it is, it does if it's your first day with a hook. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one. That's a pretty good one. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> Dude, sixth grade me killed with that joke. <laughs> I had the, uh, the neighboring church van like rocking with that one. Did you probably went so much harder on the pirate voice back then too. <laughs> probably you threw in a few probably more drug that out pretty hard yeah, i had this book <laughs> that i would read to my kids it was just like it was a pirate sea shanties kind of book uh it's like a counting kind of book where it's like a pirate falls off the boat and then there's nine and then there's eight and it's like uh and i used to do the like i would get super into it with the pirate voices and stuff and then one of the days that actually like my son was like uncomfortable with me doing the voice he's like it's made him scared <laughs> that i was like too into it and i was like oh man <laughs> like that's sad that's a sad day you used to love this you loved when i would get really into it and do the pirate voices and then it just wasn't for you anymore and kids get older and you're like man i just that was it that was like you you find that lane where you're like when your kids love something you do and when they hate it you're like it's like a joke it's weird when like a joke bombs for your kids and you're like that's that sucks. <laughs> that's a that's a bad feeling. I'm like, sure you're, that's an you're empty four. feeling. You're four, and you don't think this is funny. You don't like this anymore. It's miserable. <laughs> My dad bombed with some jokes. Eventually, he had a he definitely had a list that he pulled from. Oh yeah, I guess all he'd dads like, do. He'd be like, "What's what's what's green and red?" and goes round and round and round. And he'd be like, "I don't know." And he's like, "It's a frog in a blender." I'm like. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, I forgot that way. That's good. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a top, that's top. So Tobit gets bird poop in his eye and he goes blind. And being blind back in the day was not a fun uh a fun sentence to carry out. Um since he was blind, he couldn't work, so his wife Hannah had to kind of like go out in the fields and work to provide for the family. Uh Tobin is just miserable and he is like, he, he does a pretty long emo prayer about how like, <laughs> God, you know, I'm a great dude. You know, I kept all your commandments. Like why, why is this happening to me? And just, you know, maybe just kill me if, if, uh, if this is my, my sentence here. Oh, uh, so Job of him. God damn. Get over yourself. What's he, I mean, what did he do that was so good again? Other than bury bodies. Is he just he, still riding? that wave uh it's it's very embodies and then it's alms he talks about alms a lot that seems to be a central theme in the book is like hey give some alms, alms. did uh is this where uh bury your dead uh picked up their band name uh, it could be it's as Speaking, good a guess as any going back to uh dad jokes that need to retire that's <laughs> the last time i'll say that <laughs> So uh, Jeremiah is looking up how Barry, your dad, got their name. No, I, I, I apologize. <laughs> Something has broken at work. I'm, I'm being a terrible co-host right now. <laughs> <laughs> Something's broken and I'm chatting with the team on the side. 
<laughs> so <laughs> now we're going to do a, a, a cut to a different person. Uh, it's actually Tobit's niece, Sarah, who lives in another part of the country. And she has like a real problem on her hands. So it says that Do we uh, circle back to Tobin. Like, so we're, we're cutting from Tobin getting shit in his eye, going blind and his wife has to do all the work. And then it's just like, he, he complains to God about how that's not fair. And then that story ends. No, well it's, they, they loop together, but it's okay. like, meanwhile, across town. Okay. Okay. Um, so it says it came to pass the same day that Ekbatane, a city of media, Sarah, the daughter of Ra- Ragul, was also appro- reproached by her father's maids. Why does all of these names she- sound like something that like QAnon has a conspiracy around? Uh, I'm sure there's a Ragul Ekbatane, somewhere in there. That's definitely something that is being drained from small children by the liberal elite. Yeah, you check the roster at the Bohemian Club. I'm sure there's an Ekbatane in there. <laughs> Uh, so she's being chastised by her father's maids because that she had been married to seven husbands whom Osmodius, the evil spirit, had killed before they had lain with her. Dost thou not whoa, know, whoa. they said they, that thou hast strangled thine husbands? Thou hast already had already seven husbands, neither wast thou named after any of them. Wherefore dost thou beat us for them? If they de- If they be dead... Go thy ways after them. Let us never see of thee either son or daughter. So this basically, is, this is written she, like the Book of Mormon, which is like pretending to be something that it's not. You know, we're like, we'll just write in this style to try to fit in. It just felt clunky and weird. It it definitely does not have the poetic ring to it that you would you would hope to find in long, long lost scripture. So she had seven husbands. And they all died. They all died before the wedding night. So she's a black. Widow. Thankfully, she's still clean, but she has seven dead husbands that she's had to uh, to bury. Yeah. Isn't that aren't they? Don't they call that a black widow? I mean, it, it seems appropriate, but usually don't black widows like uh, they they mate and then they eat their husband's head off. Oh, or so right? a black widow, they would like have sex with a man and then kill them. So she's like, yes. yeah, like they got to like get the, something out of the man first. It's yeah, not like she's the opposite the of a black widow. Then it seems that uh, the people around her were they were pretty convinced that she was killing her husbands, which. Right. I mean, I mean, after, what's anybody like, supposed to think six for sure? You would think that at least. And she's up to seven. Yeah. She's a, she's got a real Eileen Wernos thing going on. <laughs> um. And Osmodius is apparently like an evil spirit or a demon that is just kind of like hanging around, haunting her cooch. Yeah, this is the same one that uh, Jesus drives out into a bunch of pigs that jump off of a cliff later. <laughs> exactly. It drove her. Oh, man, what would be an appropriate animal to drive that into? I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> it's definitely like hanging around her garden gate, though. Um, and her father's maids are beating her up about it, accusing her of killing her husbands and basically saying like, why don't you just kill yourself? You're never going to bang. Can you even honestly, if, if you've had seven dead husbands or seven dead, almost husbands and people are like, are you killing them? You really don't. You just, you just have to leave town. You don't get to be like, no, I'm not. I swear. Like you should know as a person who lives in this world, and has regular thoughts that that's what people would think. Yeah. Don't be sad about it. Just skip town, leave. And then they're still going to be like, she left because she killed her husbands. And if you don't leave, they're going to be like, she's staying because she doesn't want us to think she killed her husbands. There's no way around this. Just get the fuck out of town. You weirdo. Yeah. Blame it on your vagina demon, your teeth, <laughs> your, I remember the movie teeth. You guys remember that? No. Yeah, I never watched it. But oh, I that's a classic. That's not like a movie I'd watch. That's the one about uh, the woman who had teeth in her vagina, and every time she had sex with a man, the teeth would bite their dicks off. Why Why would you watch this movie? I didn't actually watch it, but I should have. Uh, a friend of mine watched it. It came out when we were in college. I'm looking it up now. It, it's a great concept. comedy no. horror movie. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. yeah. It's fucking... I should have watched it. It seems fucking great. <laughs> so... um. 
Sarah, she is obviously depressed, very upset about that. She cries out to God and is like, God, you know that I've been good and I haven't lost my purity. You know I didn't kill these pe- these men. Either kill me or get these people to let up and have some sympathy for me. Oh, my God. She's like, I, how wild is this, dude? She's like, she's begging God for the help. And it's like, she's married seven times and they've all died. She should be like, what the fuck is your problem, God? And she's like, it's not fair that they're thinking of me like this. The problem here <laughs> is God. OK, <laughs> it's just. She's got her priorities all fucked up. She is. She has experienced great tragedy. She's the victim in this situation. <laughs> or you... I would say it was God's problem you if pig! the apocrypha was actually the Bible. But we know we left this one out for a reason. Us Protestants. <laughs> I think they literally it makes like God look this... shitty. They literally left this book out of the Bible because there was too many women with names in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, whoa, it also whoa, seems is... like a more lame version of Job. Yeah. Like this uh, so far, I kind of agree with whoever made the decisions to leave these books we've reviewed out of the Bible. Like these ones are kind of lame. Yeah. Would an angel make it better? Oh Ooh. shoot. All right. That might right, pull it back into the uh the realm of old testament strange encounters. Well, God sends an angel to help these two to four unrelated people somewhat related people it's like watching crash that's what it feels like now we're watching crash with fucking don Cheadle and whoever else is in that movie you really (laughs) missed a chance for the big like reveal too because there's like a section in here where it literally says like so god sent an angel to fix all their problems for both of them and it's the archangel Raphael, (laughs) patron saint of pepperoni yeah i was gonna say the arc ninja turtle (laughs) uh so tobit is blind his family is destitute they're not sure what they're gonna do but his wife and his son tobias are out working trying to provide for them and suddenly in his like misery he remembers his old buddy gay bell and rages and the money that he left with him Ooh, that's a convenient time to remember all that money. Like, like four hundred thousand dollars. I had four hundred thousand dollars. I would never stop thinking about it. Your Subaru Baja bed full of silver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I had any thousands of dollars, I would never stop thinking about it. That would be the only thing I thought about all the time. Like, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. This is. I don't have to worry so much. <laughs> yeah, like. My grandma gave me savings bonds when I was like, you know, from years five to 10. And I thought about them every time I didn't have enough money to buy something stupid. I wondered if those savings bonds, one, if I could find them and two, if they were old enough to turn in yet. Yeah, (laughs) You're like a preteen. You were there were only two things you ever thought about. And it was savings bonds and jerking your dick. And you that was it. Split 50 50. <laughs> you only have so much bandwidth, you know? What about collecting the rest of like the 50 state quarters? Because I remember <laughs> thinking about that a lot when I was that age. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I made it solidly into the 30s before I was like, I don't know if this dream is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they release like a certain I had the number map of them per too. year? Oh, yeah. They spaced them out. Like you couldn't just go out and get them all at once. Like, oh, yeah. I had the map too where you stick them all in the states. Oh, my like, God, but they I spaced it out. I forgot like, about that. Yeah, I can't I can't stick with this this long. Jeremiah's having a guilty thought that like, I hope Jesus doesn't come back before they release <laughs> Hawaii and Alaska. <laughs> oh my god. I dude, I had the map. I fucking forgot about that completely. How's I Hawaii up, get a special probably, quarter and they don't they're not even a state? I had like probably less than I would have had less than twenty five for sure. I, I didn't stick to that. Uh and time went by so much slower at that age too. Like now, like five years could go by, like, and you're just like, didn't it's been like two, right? And but when you're at like 12 and 13, like a year feels like three years, and you're waiting all this time for a state quarter. Yeah, there's just not a lot to look forward to at that age, I guess. So, uh, Tobit decides, you know, because he's blind, it's going to be tough for him to recover this money. So, he's going to send his son Tobias to go get it, right? Um, So he pumps him up, but offers him a grave warning. He says, quote, beware of all whoredom, my son, and chiefly 
Take a wife of the seed of thy fathers, and take not a strange woman to wife, which is not of thy father's tribe. Now therefore, my son, love thy brethren, and despise not in thy heart thy brethren, the sons and daughters of thy people, in not taking a wife of them. For in pride is destruction and much trouble, and in lewdness is decay and great want. For lewdness is the mother of famine. I can see why the Catholics kept this. <laughs> yeah, so it's like uh, give lots of money. He he also touches on alms a bunch in that speech. He's he basically boils down alms. to like give lots of money and watch out for for sluts. Yeah. Uh, speaking of money, just doubling back to the, the 50 state quarters program, because I know everybody was really interested to hear the answer. <laughs> uh, it launched in 1999. It ran for 10 years through 2008. That's too long. Like, that's too long for a kid to be interested in collecting quarters. The kid who's interested in collecting quarters at the start of that is not going to be interested 10 years from them. Um, <laughs> and the two last ones were Alaska and Hawaii. Yeah. Like the last five states were Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, Alaska, and Hawaii. Dude, Dang, you probably could have. We were all like, w- like hoping that when we bought our like our booster pack of Pokemon cards, that we would have got the right quarterback. It, when we could have just gone to a bank the whole time and probably just asked for each one <laughs> that we needed. <laughs> We'd love to watch like a uh, uh, like a grandma just like forcing them to break roll after roll of quarters, looking for like you know the the West Virginia one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then she writes a check for it. <laughs> I was con- I was like, we I need to do this because it'll be worth money someday. Like that's all you thought about then. You're like, these will be. This is a collector's thing. It'll be worth something. I need to. I gotta figure stick out how to make out. money on this. I really <laughs> want to. So, uh, Tobin, you know he's he. I keep calling him Tobin. Tobit. He pumps up Tobias, gives him all the warnings about women and and money. Uh, he makes a writes a letter for him so that Gabriel will know who he is. And and then he tells him, like, hey, you can't go on your own. You need to go find a guide. So he walks out in town looking for someone who knows the way to rages. And he just so happens to run into this beautiful, beautiful man. Um, I watched a, a, uh, a turn. This is a turn of the story. I watched a cartoon version of this today. There was like an animated version of the story on uh, on YouTube, and <laughs> it was like thirty minutes long. It was a long ordeal. Is and... every is Catholic anime any good? Catholic <laughs> anime. <laughs> yeah, I I put it on par with most anime that I've seen. It's it's better than the uh, the like. IT educational anime videos that I have to watch for work now. And that is that is a real thing that I have to do is watch the IT department has like an ninjio anime training videos that you have to watch Dude, and then that's answer. Such a try hard move. On. It's so I I used to have to watch at my last company I used to have to watch the similar videos of like cybersecurity shit to like basically not get like st- caught on some sort of phishing scam through email and whatever but it's like they didn't stoop so low as to make us watch weird anime it's always got like one b-list celebrity in each one and it's like you know uh data phishing featuring john lovitz Ooh, he's been in several of them featuring one of the baldwins (laughs) yeah the christian (laughs) one could be any one of them. It's like Baldwin Roulette. <laughs> There's so like seven. You don't right? want to pull the hammer back on. Who's the Christian Baldwin that's insufferable? Steven. Steven. Okay. Steven, yeah. <laughs> he's like a he's like a uh, uh, a puffy uh, Kurt Cameron. <laughs> okay, so uh, he he stumbles across this handsome handsome man. Uh, who turns out to be Raphael, the archangel, but he's calling himself Azarius. So Azarius says, hey, I know the way, and I actually know Gabel. I've stayed at his house before, and I'd be happy to go with you. So he takes him back. Tobit is like overjoyed, agrees to pay him a a drachm per day with a bonus 
if he brings his son back uh, unburied, I guess. And with that blessing, they depart on their way to Rages. So Rages, this is, is the more I hear it, it just feels like it sounds like a bar, just some like dive bar in the middle of some shit ass city. You guys going to Rages tonight? Oh, man. Yeah, that would be off. Like they're playing like 2001 club music. Yeah. And it's just old alcoholics like hitting on teenagers. <laughs> just a bunch of like people in their 50s that dropped a bunch of tabs of acid. <laughs> So, um, Azarius, who is actually Raphael, and Tobias set out for Rages. And the first major thing that they come to on their travels is the Tigris River. And Azarius says, hey, let's camp here for the night. So Tobias, you know, seeing the river, he's like, I'm going to go scrub my extremities and take a bath. So he goes out into the water and a fish, like, just latches onto his foot. It's like a, a big pleco tries to, to suck his toe. He goes catfishing. What is it with, uh, what, no, what is, rip? What's the, uh, what, noodling? Do do it in, like Louisiana noodling. Yeah. <laughs> it's still called noodling when the people like they get down in the water and they stick their whole arm in there. Is yeah. that still noodling? Yeah. That's is just, it a, is it a catfish that like grabs you up to your elbow and you pull it out? Yep. Yeah. Hell yeah. Huge catfish. And you can, and they're so big, you can get your arm like all the way through the gills, like out the front of their mouth too. And, and people have died doing it because they, they like they're too much underwater. So like they get their arm in, but then it pulls them into the hole too much, and they like end up underwater and they can't get out. It. I I don't have the guts to do it. I mean, maybe with somebody who knew what they were doing, I would try it. But like, I don't know, snapping turtles. I mean. Man, that can go so wrong, it seems like. And then all of a sudden, you've got a mangled, bloody stump of a hand. Oh, dude, I would never. I would never put my whole fist into a giant hole, hoping that a catfish was on the other end, just so I could pull it out. Dude, they can bite, too. Like, they can bite pretty hard. Like, they might not have, like, you know, jagged little shark teeth, but they've got, like, that bony ridge of, like, you know, 40 grit sandpaper. Yeah, I was just going to say. it tear you up getting your arm jerked off by sandpaper <laughs> so so tobias was noodling in the river <laughs> and this giant fish comes up and it says that it would have devoured him um but uh Raphael says hey grab hold of that thing <laughs> he's like let it let it finish with your foot let it finish let it, <laughs> let it take what it needs of you you know and it's then like drag Uncle it on shore Uncle Eddie from uh, Christmas Vacation. <laughs> I just, just let it finish. finish. So he drags this big fish up on shore, and he's like, "Man, we're gonna we're gonna feast on this thing." And Raphael's like, "He's like, okay, but um, he said unto him, touching the heart and the liver, if a devil. Oh wait, wow. Well, he says the angel tells him to drag it ashore, gut it, and he's supposed to keep the heart, the liver, and the gallbladder of the fish." separate the rest they roast and they eat it so he's got this like these bit of fucking, awful all this wrapped is dumb up. dude these people act like witchcraft is problematic and then they're like listening to this shit and they're like you got to keep the heart and the liver and the gallbladder separate you're like this feels like a spell immediately it's like an eye of newt it's very much like that yeah it's it's definitely got like a witchcraft sort of feel to it so tobias asked why keep these fish guts why do I have to carry these fish guts around with us on our on our trip? And he said unto him, touching the heart and the liver, if a devil or an evil spirit trouble any, we must make a smoke thereof before the man or the woman, and the party shall be no more vexed. As for the gall, it is good to anoint a man with um, anoint a man that hath whiteness in his eyes, and he shall be healed. Oh. I could see why the Catholics the kept nose. this one. Uh, <laughs> has whiteness. They're like, thou must all wearest t-shirts that saith, fish guts drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so they eat their fish to pack up the guts and they get back on the road. Um, the angel kind of tells him ahead of time that they were going to be staying with his cousin, Sarah, who he told him in advance is hot and smart. The angel's cousin? 
No, uh, Tobias's cousin. Tobias's cousin. That's who they're staying with. And he says immediately, do you want to stay with my super hot, smart cousin? Exactly. He's like, hey, your cousin, who is both, uh, she's both beautiful and wise, uh, you guys are going to be married. So literally just breaks it to him. This book kind of like spoils a lot of surprises throughout the story that it could just hold on to. It's like, why hold on to these yeah. fish guts? And it's like, well, in case someone goes blind and someone has like a genital demon. <laughs> they certainly don't bury the lead at all, ever. No, it's it's very on the nose. Um, so Tobias, who kind of had an idea of what had happened in the past, he says, I am afraid lest if I go in unto her, I die as the other before. For a wicked spirit loveth her, which hurteth nobody but those which come unto her, wherefore I also fear lest I die and bring my father's and my mother's life because of me to the grave with sorrow, for they have no other son to bury them. So apparently rumors out about uh, the the evil spirit hanging over his cousin. Hmm. So um, they make it to, uh, to Raphael and Tobias. They kind of make it to that point. Um, and he says, you know, he basically shares his stress, you know, how he's stressed about being with her. Raphael says, and when thou shalt come into the marriage chamber, thou shalt take the ashes of perfume <laughs> and shalt lay them upon and shalt lay upon them some of the heart and liver of the fish and shalt make a smoke with it. And the devil shall smell it and flee away and never come again any more. But when thou shalt come to her, rise up both of you and pray to God, which is merciful, who will have pity on you and save you. This is interesting because uh, unless it's a translation error or issue res- referring to the devil, this that would be peculiar for something written uh, at, for this time period. Uh, if it, I, I just throughout the Old Testament, there's no real like concept of the devil, so to just like toss it in like that is strange. Very yeah. curious. It like does the have devil a lot of be things sc- that- Also the devil fucking sucks. Why are Christians so scared of this? Yeah, bitch? that's right. Oh, okay. We're going in different because, directions here. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, yeah, fuck Satan. Yeah, no, but it's like this bitch is afraid of s- the smell of fish organs. It's like, if you could scare him off with that, why are we so fucking worried about him? Why did I spend my entire childhood wondering that he could just like, drag me to hell because I thought the wrong thing when all I had to do was smoke a fucking fish heart under my bed and then have sex with my future wife on it. I mean, easy peasy. I would have been so much better than the turmoil I went through. Just fucking women over fish guts constantly would have been the easiest way to avoid hell. But instead you would have known about it. If only they would have saw fit to put this in to the, uh, the King James version that uh, Protestantism is really what did me the big disservice. And honestly, Catholics read your Bible more. Uh, you could be having such a good time. If you just knew these stories, your parents are like, what are you doing? You can't be having sex with your boyfriend in, in your bedroom, in my house. And you're like, no, it's fine. Look I have under a the, bag look under the bed. trout gallbladders. Yeah, she's like, look under the bed, mom. She's like, I'm afraid. I don't want to see what's under the bed. And she's like, no, look under the bed. And it's just like a bunch of coals, hot coals, smoking fish guts over them, just filling the mattress. I mean, it's, it's a really beautiful and godly, and, and these parents just have such a huge problem with it. So, I don't know. Catholics, read your Bibles. Uh, you might be able to have a little bit more fun than us uh, silly evangelicals. So when Tobias and Raphael get to Ekbatane, which is where they were headed, right? They went to his uncle Ragul and his aunt Edna's house and introduced themselves. Uh, everybody's super excited. They're like, "Oh my God, you look just like our uh, our cousin Tobit," you know. And he's like, "I am, I am Tobit's son." And he's like, "Oh, that's great. How's Tobit?" And he's like, "He's really good. He's blind. He has bird poop in his eyes." And they mourned. They all mourned, and so, then they just gave him thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he said, uh, you know, basically like, hey, we should talk about your your super hot cousin, my daughter, (laughs) who is yours by right. Ew. There was a lot of like, 
you you have a right to her she's yours that sort of thing also she's you know she's her bed surrounded by skulls of past suitors and uh <laughs> he's kind of like yeah i know i heard it's all good so oh my he, god the suspense does he die this is where it comes full circle right yeah it, it literally like the way it's written it sounds like they showed up they ate some crackers together and then he like took one of each of their hands and was like, guess what? You're married now. Go consummate. And I mean, it's like, like the night that they got there and met for the first time, they decided that yeah. they were getting married. So he meets her for the first time. They get married and he he's he knows that she's had seven husbands that have died on the night of consummation, but have never have never consummated. So he is rolling into this wondering if he's going to die before exactly. he has sex with her. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And as he went towards the, uh, the the wedding chambers, right, he remembered the words of Raphael and took the ashes of the perfumes and put the heart and the liver of the fish thereupon and made a smoke therewith. Uh, the, the witch, that which smell when the evil spirit had smelled he fled unto the utmost parts of Egypt, and the angel bound him. <laughs> okay, the spirit is in the utmost parts of Egypt and bound there. That apparently Egypt is where he fled. Very to. little con. I mean, I would love to know more about the spirit and what he did in Egypt, but I guess like, that's the end of it. I guess that's all we know about this spirit. Old West train robbers always flee to Mexico when their their career is up. You know, Tijuana. Yeah, so Egypt is basically Tijuana for demons. It's uh the the people who flee to Tijuana are old West train robbers and Kid Rock. Kid Rock <laughs> loves to sing about Tijuana. He's just got a passion for donkey shows. <laughs> but dude, Ragul, he was like very upset about all this. Like he was super concerned about his nephew slash Dying? son-in-law. It says, so they slept both that night, and Ragul arose and went, and he dug a grave, saying, I fear lest he also be dead. He was so convinced that he was going to die. It's incredible. Yeah, it must just be a family thing. Like, if Tobit was there, he for sure would have dug a grave just for good measure. (laughs) 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 But when Ragul was come into his house, he said unto his wife Edna, Send one of the one of the maids and let her see whether he be alive. If he be not, that we may bury him and no man know it. <laughs> so it's just like, dude, we can't we can't have another head on the man. Like, we got to keep this real quiet. We got to keep this to seven. If it's eight, shit's fucked. I mean, eight is just seven was a problem, but eight ruins everything. He's the only person in the story that tries to bury the lead. <laughs> so the maid went, opened the door and went in and found them both asleep and came forth and told them that he was alive. Uh, so everybody's happy. Um, they end up getting, getting a hold of uh, gay bell. He, you know, they fill in the, the letter, they fill in the ditch. Yeah. Decides to, uh, you know, Hey, here's your thousand pounds of silver. And they set off for home. Um, Once he gets home, their pants sagging immensely from all the silver coins in their pockets. (laughs) I love the idea of them just having like a a huge stick and bindle. (laughs) (laughs) It just looked like the Grinch stole Christmas, like at the end. (laughs) It did just like his pockets bulging out like that. (laughs) He's just waddling and, and kicking out silver coins everywhere he went. <laughs> but uh, they get home. Everybody's happy. His dad's happy that he's back and alive and stuff. And it says, and and he took hold of his father and he strake of the gall on his father's eyes saying, be of good hope, my father. And when his eyes began to smart, he rubbed them and he could see again. Began to smart like as in hurt like that smarts. Like, uh, yeah, that seems to be the uh, the case. That's a, that's a biblical term. I was unaware that that the etymology for smarts went back to two to three hundred BC. But wow, 
Fascinating. When his eyes began to smart, he rubbed them, and the whiteness pilled away from the corners of his eyes. And when he saw his son, he fell upon his neck, and he wept and said, Blessed art thou, O God, and blessed is thy name forever, and blessed are all thine holy angels. And uh, he, you know, apparently like was going to give the the angel a whole bunch of money, just split everything that they brought back like down the middle. So he was got a a big bonus for saving him from digging a hole. (laughs) And everybody lived happily ever after. Wow. What an incredible heart lifting story that is incredibly inconsequential. What does it mean? I can see why they left it out of the Bible. It has no impact on anything, anywhere, at any time. None of that matters. <laughs> it's like a sixth grade creative writing project. <laughs> yeah, like, dude. and then, and then uh, there was a fish, and it was big. It could have killed him, but instead, it just sucked his foot. And he <laughs> took it, and he he made medicine out of its guts. And, medicine and for he, later, not for now. And he bought a smoker. Uh, one of those eggs that's really popular right now. Yeah, the big green egg. Yeah, he bought the big green egg and he smoked the the gizzards, uh, in the under the bed where they had sex because, uh, of course they had sex and that is what made them all not die and they they lived happily ever after. It's 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 basically like spending your wedding night in like a uh, an Alaskan trout smokehouse sort of it, thing, a canning facility maybe. <laughs> it's an insane story it has um i honestly don't know what there even is to glean from that uh the, it's like a trust trust god i don't even see where god comes into play there like the whole story is seen it's like um it's like the scene at the end of uh what's the uh adam sandler movie uh happy madison is that it? Billy Madison? Billy Happy Madison. Gilmore? Happy Madison's Click. the production thing. Yeah, yeah. Billy Madison at the end where he just like goes on that like rant about whatever historical thing he was supposed to talk about. And it's just like everyone in the audience is now dumber having heard that story. It just <laughs> it's like listening to that and then being like, what was I supposed to glean from that? Nothing. There's nothing of value in that story. No, it's it's. It's pretty much just a story. That's it. I know I was having the same thoughts about it earlier because it's like, man, there's not really much in terms of like, like deeper themes going on here. Why other split than like, hairs over this book? Why? Like even the even when you're trying to figure out like at some point, everyone brought the whatever these books are in the Apocryphus, people brought them to these councils or like we need this. And they're like, why? And they're like, because I love this story. And they go, this story is dumb as fuck. And they're like but I think we should keep it. And they go, you're not part of us anymore. And they're like, I'm going to die on this hill. This story means everything to me. <laughs> it's like, what are we doing? Why does this story matter? Why did you not just throw it out when a bunch of people are like, this book sucks. It means nothing. There's no historical value. There's no historical. That's what I'm saying. Context. The Protestants, they, they, I, I'm kind of on their side on this one. Like, <laughs> this one should have been cut. They made a good decision. Yeah. The Catholics are just going for the extended edition. They're like it, directors cutting the Bible. And like, those aren't always the better versions of the yeah, movies. It's the director's cut where you're like, that's when you watch it. Well, it's not the director's cut. Actually. It's like the, the third or fourth string producer on the movie cut of the movie. Like that's the problem. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I remember the first time I watched deleted scenes in my life was for the first Spider-Man movie. Well, the one with tugboat McGuire. <laughs> and it, it it was I don't even remember the scene. I just remember like and you you didn't watch the deleted scenes. It, it wasn't a director's cut where you watched it through with like the the content that was cut added. It was like you could just like go to the DVD selection screen and hit deleted scenes and like watch through five of them. And I remember being like, oh my god, this is sick. I've I've never. I've never been able to, I mean, I owned Spider-Man on VHS first. So I remember getting the DVDs for things and being able to go to deleted scenes. You're like, this is sick. Like, I feel like I'm like really going to tap into something. Uh, And then you watch it. And even at 11 or 12 or 13, I don't remember how old I was. I just remember watching it being like, that scene sucked. Like that good (laughs) thing. They cut that. That was worthless. All the fluff. And that that is what didn't need to be in it. Yeah, and what is what's this book called? Is it the Book of Tobith? 
Yeah. Uh, that the book of Tobith is to the Bible worse than what the deleted scenes to the original Spider-Man movie is to Spider-Man. Yeah. All I wanted was like a longer, a longer version of the, uh, the, you know, the, the wrestling match scene with bone saw. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Was uh, that the macho man? Uh, yes, I macho don't man, know. Randy Savage. Yep. It was bone saw. But I do... hey, freak show. You're going nowhere. I no way. Holy shit. Randy yeah. Savage was who was in Spider-Man. Yep. Fuck, that's sick. Bonesaw I never realized ready. that. Hell yeah, that's awesome. I I remember when I first went to see the X-Men movie, the first X-Men movie, and they had like the cage fight scene with Wolverine in it. I was like, I was just mesmerized. I couldn't believe I was watching. I was such a huge X-Men fan. Uh, but it also was like, is this the right, are we at the right movie? This doesn't feel X-Men-y at all. Like being into like this cage oh, fight when scene. He, when he slices that shotgun in half on the bar stool. The coolest. Yeah. I fucking dude that watching that movie as like a 12 year old was like quintessential happiness. I, that was, it was a good movie. The first two X-Men movies were great. They fucked up every single X-Men movie ever since, except for the Logan movie. That movie ripped that movie. Dude, fucking Logan ripped. was great. That's like my uh, favorite one. I think. Yeah. It's incredible. And they've ruined every other X-Men movie completely. All of them suck. Uh, I had, I was a huge X-Men fan. I mean, I read from when the comics started up through the early nineties. I've, I had read every single one of them. Like I remember going to watch the movies. Like I remember rereading them to go watch the movies and then just being thoroughly disappointed with the way that just like they introduce characters and fuck man. It, if anything that that's what obliterated my hope or care for anything Marvel. I, I was always considered like everyone was always like, did you see the new Marvel movie? I'm like, no, I haven't because I liked X-Men and I liked Spider-Man and both of those fucked me over so bad that I've sworn off Marvel movies ever since. <laughs> Dude, Sarah was basically a uh, rogue. Sarah. It's like every time somebody touched her, uh, <laughs> tried to <laughs> slip a finger <laughs> she like sucked their life force out of them <laughs> she right. absorbed their powers and left them a, a chilled corpse and uh with that we've come full circle and we've uh i think it's time to bring this episode to a close <laughs> <laughs> well i hope you all enjoyed the book of tobit and uh i hope you all have learned a lot about the medical and spiritual properties of uh, aquatic gallbladders. So um, if you like the show, leave it a review, share it with buddies. If, uh, if you like music, go check out our buddies in mighty their new album drops this week. And if you're not in the discord, join up, join up and yell with us in uh, type format about whatever's ailing you video games or, you know, televangelist, you name it, anything you want. Or uh, the video I took of my crickets fucking that we talked about on last week's episode. That's in there too. If you want to see what happens when crickets fuck. Yeah. Bottom cricket doing work. Oh, they do work, baby. <laughs> creek, creek, creek. <laughs> so that being said, I hope everybody has a good week and we will talk to you next time. Bye.